always dealing with the uh, we are always dealing with top level domains for pages subdomains but I didn't think of that if there is a subgroup with the same path as a top level uh, group path, the lookup may return the wrong group. Ah, I see. And, and we return totally wrong uh, lookup path and it can't find the file in, in uh, 404. So it's easy fix, but. Uh, you just throw yeah. back the optimization or you made well, sure that it's top level group? Uh, no, I, I, uh, uh, I mean the fix. Yeah, uh, we just need to add where parent ID is new. So it's okay. To, to, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's it. It's unfortunate we were close this time. Okay. So we roll um, back to 0% uh, again, right? Well, I, I asked Amar to do it, but he haven't done it yet. And he's like, stopped answering, but I guess it will happen anytime now. So okay. uh, if, if we want, we can uh, move on to the, whatever the, the main topic of this, this meeting should be, I guess, object uh, storage. Yeah, I originally asked Alessio and Camille to join us because of that. Uh, but we didn't make much discussion on that topic. Uh, I don't know, I haven't read it much myself uh, mm -hmm. and and yeah unfortunately we can uh, decided to scale down a bit our like efforts on pages so it will take longer uh, uh, well yeah we still can yeah anyway it. I, yeah. I had a uh, i had a chat with jaime earlier today and he said he's working on like the the, the research issue and uh uh, he said he has some basic uh, uh, variant of this working, but yeah, there will be a questions we need to answer and like decisions to make. But that's kind of the goal of that of that work is doing to to find all the unknowns. Does he already have merge request? Uh, I'm not sure about. I haven't seen one, so I think he he hasn't submitted uh, anything yet. I'll, yeah, we can I'll... ask him. Yeah, I also don't see anything in my mail, so I'd probably mm. not push yeah, yet. Probably, probably uh, not. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. Let's let's probably just restate uh, like the plan we were uh, going to do. I don't know. Uh, as I understand it, uh, we will just uh, use artifacts which are already pushed by Pages Job. Uh, unzip it on pages site uh, and surf uh, individual resources from that. Is that correct, Alessio? Well, is that the idea? That, that last yeah, part. I, I, <clears throat> so I, I, I think this is the main idea that Camille tested in, in his experiment. So yeah, because we already have the, the artifacts uploaded. So uh, maybe we should make sure that there's no cancellation policy in place, expiry policy in place for those artifacts. Otherwise, yeah, we we'll, we no longer have it. But yes, I think this is the main point. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess the second question was, uh, if we, oh, actually, okay, there is some agenda for today. Anyway, uh, the second question is, what did Camille meant by uh, caching like zip headers or like, uh, I don't know, unzipping oh, sure. the first part? Yeah, I okay. didn't get it. Okay, so I, I can try to explain this. So basically what happened with zip archives is that the format is kind of lazy. So you have um, a table of content that tells you where the thing are inside the artifact. Problem, the problem here is that, uh, if I remember correctly, because I've spent, it was a long time ago, basically if you need to update an, an archive that already exists, the, and by you I mean every zip client, they can append something to the end of the file and append a new table. So 
what happens is that you should scroll the the, the, the or the file backward or just you you need to search the last table at the end of the file and with that you can reach every file within the archive which means that you may append something and kind of uh, you may have an old file inside the same archive but you don't use it because it's no longer referenced by the final table so this doesn't happen in our case because we know how we build the the art the zip archive because it is built by gitlab itself so there's no magic tricks around this is just one table at the end but the point is that we if you can cache those information you you have an, uh, you have pointers and when you have pointers you can basically uh, o open the um, with a ranged request to the object storage exactly the file that you need so that you don't have to download the zip archive locally and i think this was the the point Camille was doing so if of the first time you just dump somewhere that 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 table then you can reference it and directly pinpoint files on them so i, I think i can archive. explain it as well because basically uh i know this problem very well uh and you might be surprised but we actually do have caching for that already done and we are using that extensively <clears throat> so the, the problem is that basically the table of content in a zip file zip archive is at the end of the file or basically you need to read entire file until you encounter some you know uh, uh, mark that the table of content starts here and then you can read the table of content and you basically know exactly after reading it uh, at which bytes uh, file compressed file start at each byte in a file compressed file ends so you can basically open just the, the file uh, you, you you can just read from the object storage from the byte the file starts until the byte that file ends you read that you can uncompress it when you receive it and serve the file so <clears throat> we we've built the build artifacts browser uh, almost five years ago and um, basically right now you can go to the gitlab ui if you have artifacts you can browse them you can download download single files from within an archive and this already works right it, it works quite well you don't we, we we never extract entire file we never download ex entire file we never extract entire file somewhere to just read one file if the file is like one gigabyte we extract only and and you want to access the file that is like 10 bytes large we just read those 10 bytes from the object storage and uncompress that and serve the file and in order to do that we had to design this caching method and currently whenever gitlab rails receives uh, the the artifact zip art uh, 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 zip artifact we are trying to find the table of content and we are generating a binary file that represents a cached version of table of content and we persist it uh, separately as a second build artifact this time we call it build artifact metadata and it's already in the object search as well so we should have the cached version the cached you know artifact the the, the met metadata artifact for every uh, zip artifact also in the object storage. And I think it should work. I, I think that the biggest concern I have regarding serving files directly from object storage is just speed and efficiency. These days, you know, people uh, want to deploy their code to the edge with, um, you know, in, in the mesh of three complex CDN so that it's blazing fast and giving, architecting the system in a way that it's actually much slower because it, it won't be ever that, as fast as, you know, other solutions are. That, that's my biggest concern. Perhaps it's okay. Perhaps it's a good first step and we can move out of NFS, and provide some slow solution and improve it later. But I, I think it's inherently difficult to improve it later uh, with this design. And that's my only concern. Yeah, I think that, so, uh... I think that Camille's idea on this was that, yeah, he was aware that we already have the, um, the metadata, but I think he was meaning that we should 
store in memory the content of the metadata so that we remove one request because artifact browsing is simple now it, no, you don't do this very often you can you may kind of expect this to be slow also because it happened in the context of a regular uh, gitlab.com request so you have everything else around it you have database queries and things like that if, but if you think of um, a static site generator you want you really want to remove many of those things so i think that the Camilla idea out here was that we download the um, the metadata from object storage we cache it in memory in redis i don't know what was this idea and so that uh within the so what the the, the, the pages daemon has this uh, hard data in, in memory and old requests that we just uh, go to the same cache information so it was kind yes. of another cache <clears throat> yeah, so I think it's actually a good idea to cache uh, the table of content metadata in memory because it's quite small and it's also gzip and it's in the you know binary format, so it's very minimal. It's not large, of course. The size depends on the amount of entries you have in the zip file. So uh, having like one million entries in the zip file might result in having the metadata that probably a few megabytes large, but few megabytes, it's still probably not that bad. But still for every request, we will need to make a request to object storage and uh, proxy the stuff this way. So okay. I'm, I'm there's a way to make it more efficient. Like I, I feel like the metadata is not a problem because we have it, we can cache it in the pages node. We can, but then we also need to read stuff from object storage and compress that. Yeah. Uh, it takes probably a few milliseconds. In one of the first discussion around this, when we are still deciding how to move forward, one of the proposal was that the artifact in object storage was just a kind of a seeding mechanism. So the first time a pages daemon receive a request, it will serve it from the object storage directly with this mechanism and will start a um, dump on disk procedure in parallel. So that we'll download the uh, all the site and dump it on disk the same way we do today, so that you can serve it from disk for the next request. And so when you restart the pages, you don't have to read to scan the disk. You can just wipe everything and start from scratch. So you you don't have the um, the load time at the beginning. Yeah. So I, I think it actually makes sense, but still, uh, yeah. It, it still means that we will need a jailing uh, code in, in the GitLab pages. And my initial idea was to separate that to, that to a separate daemon, but it does not necessarily need to be a separate daemon. What is jailing? A jail root. We oh, have the GH root. Yeah, okay. But if, if, we, if we cache anything on disk, uh, will that be per each pages daemon running? Because we, one of the other goals we have is to like get a, uh, get rid of NFS and share. Yeah, share yeah, the... it's local disk. Yeah, it's a local disk. Um, so it's it's an ephemeral information. You can just destroy the machine, start a new one, or what? just scale the machines, and the next machine will, at the first request, will download mm. and dump everything. So, and that so will through the still object storage. Will that work for the Kubernetes deployment of pages? They'll yeah, need to have a mount. Can, yeah, okay. You can create an empty DIR mount and say, please reserve some space on disk for this. And when the, the pod is killed, everything is removed. So, so my, my case, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so my suggestion about using a separate daemon uh, had also one uh, like. Like I, I wanted to use a separate daemon to solve one additional problem. So currently uh, we don't really have a way to load balance requests in a way that a request for a domain, mydomain.com is always going to hit one node, the same node. So it means that we will need to basically keep the same cache on every node and uh, the cache will grow to the size of uh, all the domains and pages being used at the moment on gitlab.com, right? So it means that it, the size of the cache will need to be basically the same on every node. And uh, we don't really know what is the size of pages 
that we serve like what is the medium you know average size of all the pages that we need to serve in a given moment for like an hour or depending on the cache expiration expiration so <clears throat> what what i wanted to what i was proposing is basically uh, making it possible for pages to behave as a load balancer with some sane strategy for sharding that stuff, but it might not be really necessary. So the question that I think we need to have an answer for is what's the size of pages? What's the average size of pages we are serving right now uh, in a given moment? Like, you know, do, do we understand what, 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 what I'm yeah. trying to explain? Yeah, I, I think that... Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, a uh, couple points. First is that uh, a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, I noticed that one node of pages was serving significantly more uh, pages than all other uh, nodes, like five times more. And I uh, discovered that all, uh, like this uh, huge uh, increase was because of docsgitlab.com. So basically only one node serves docsgitlab.com. GitLab and as I understand it, it's kind of, Kind of evidence that we already have this like sticky by domain uh, ro ro load balancing for pages. Yes. But you can't do sticky like domain sticky load balancing uh, for pages that are encrypted. And uh, I think I, th I think we GitLab uh, like docs GitLab.com should be encrypted already. So. So it, it's possible that we have load balancing that supports uh, TLS SNI uh, load balancing, but yeah, if we do have this already, it would be cool. Yeah, and the second point is, uh, I guess we shouldn't just uh, store all pages. We can limit it to like a few gigabytes and use some LRU cache or whatever. Uh, I also thought maybe we, uh, I don't know. I kind of like the idea of uh, storing and caching files separately, not unzipping the whole archive, like on warming up. I guess when people will open their website for the first time, most of the resources will be loaded. Uh, and then only like single pages will be loaded on requests and all like CSS and images will be already there. Uh, so what do you think about that? I was going to say exactly the same thing, so <laughs> I, I agree. Okay. So, but do, do you mean that just uh, for the caching stuff, do you mean instead of dumping the full archive, you just dump the content that you read? So the next, because yeah. you imagine that the index page will be served most of the time, but maybe you have some big image or some big artifacts in some pages that Which nobody cares about. Yeah, okay, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And LRU caching as well, yeah, sure. Yeah, so just to check if we are on the same page, you suggest that we cache locally only uh, files retrieved from the object storage, not entire archives, but uh, the files that were requested. Yeah, it, it can really reduce the size. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, so I, I have a question. Uh, Maybe naive, but for why don't for pages to, we store those files not zipped on object storage? Because by the way, that's how I, I initially understand the whole idea. So that we can always serve them directly. Is that because saving space storage or what? Well, I think it's well, started I... from artifacts, and artifacts are packaged together. It's, yeah, yeah. It's the, the yeah, but my understanding was that like the that uh, update pages service that is now like unzipping the artifacts and saving them the, in NFS. I I somehow understood that it will do the same, but instead instead of saving in NFS, it will put to like object storage or S3 or whatever, and then we like directly just proxy to, to those files directly. But yeah, I see now what you all had in mind. It was just so it wasn't one, obvious one, to be. <clears throat> one problem with the current zip uh, artifacts and object storage case is that basically we might not have like 50% of the artifacts already because of yeah. the expiration, the default expiration and stuff like that. So yeah, that's why. 
Yeah, that's why I was thinking if we store them somewhere like explicitly just for pages, they'll like not be expired and we will always. So perhaps be that's a good idea to actually uh, add additional code to Rails that whenever we receive pages artifacts, we are extracting them and putting in the object storage, and this way we won't need to have you know, the uh, table of content, caching stuff, and we'll save some milliseconds on extracting files as well, but it, it might result in a huge cost actually, but yeah. Yes. Not only, mm -hmm. we will also lose the symlinking feature. So in artifacts, you can store a symlink, but it's mm -hmm. sorry, in a zipper card, you can store a symlink, but you cannot do the same on object yeah, storage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I but I, I guess that the symlink can be implemented in pages. Like we can put some kind of a symlink like file in object storage and allow pages to recognize the format of the symlink. And like this, this can be probably solved by writing some custom code. Is symlink stored in this pages metadata, like artifacts metadata, or, or we need to access files? That's a good. A uh, question and I, I, don't I don't know. know. I don't know. Okay. Mm, so many questions. Yeah. So how to? By the way, the cost will be hard. I mean, we should make sure that costs do not explode, which I think it will happen. But I mean, by cost you mean like uh, the storage this, cost. This, the storage is okay. Oh. Like the, the, there is also some cost of NFS, right? And if we get rid of this, perhaps the st storing files in in the object storage is going to cost less and uncompressed. I don't know. So, how how do? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I mean, I, I do agree. I mean, it's it's just something that we have to keep up in mind. It also, I would like to add that it adds some complexity in terms of um, dealing with deployment. Right, because right now you have this on disk, okay, it's okay. Or you have the artifact, so you can kind of link the, la the last deployment artifact and read from that. But if you extract it, then you have to create uh, structures when you have version one of the site, version two, version three, so deployment one, deployment two, deployment three, whatever. And I do agree that you don't want this to expire, but I would add that I would really love to see old version of the site expire after a period of time if we have a, a more recent version, because there's no value for us in paying the cost of having thousand version of the site. Think about our documentation side, or I think, I don't know if the, our documentation <laughs> side is on pages. There is some sense in keeping more than one version. You can have the preview of your next deployment. You can have a button to roll back to the previous one. But yeah, but how many of this? Yeah, that's that's a problem. Last easy. last three deployments. Now, by the way, now when we have the API service serving the domain configuration, we can actually easily, I think, support such versions. Because if we have some just data in the uh, like the different buckets and somewhere in the database, we can uh, re return this from the API. So I, I think we would need to have a separate table in our PostgreSQL database that would track the buckets and uh, versions and Pages API will also take a look at the uh, deployments, Pages deployments table to you know, provide information about the buckets and stuff to Pages daemon. Yes, yeah, I'm just saying that it might be doable, but yeah, I get, I get your point. Yeah. So, so my question is that basically that is that it again a really nice complex challenging problem to solve. But what would be the first step to move forward? Like, of course, having to call is the first step. What was the next one? Well, uh, yeah, I was hoping from the the, the that Spike Jaime is doing. Uh, one of the results will be we'll have like more clear vision what needs to be done, so it's easier to break it down in like smaller chunks and uh, start iterate on it, but I don't know the answer yet, so. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think we need to wait and then we can like post 1000 comments on this merge request, like spawn, spawn issues from that. What merge request do you uh, need? Like, yeah, what I, uh, I mean, Jaime is currently doing uh, 
like POC of doing that, basically taking the Camille's code and integrating it in the current version of Pages and see how it works. Yeah, I wouldn't fix on the code itself now, but we would rather use it as a way to, to like split it in smaller chunks and start, start actually doing it. And uh, maybe like the other benefit of this pack will be to find any possible problems that will hit other, this, uh, other than those that we were just talking about. Uh, but Jagos, if you, if you have the uh, idea what could be the first step or the first few steps, uh, just say so. So POCs are, are usually a good first step. And uh, I think that the getting answers for the size of pages, we would need to keep in the cache uh right now th th this how how can we actually understand what's the size of pages we are serving right now perhaps we could add some uh metrics to the files that we are serving right now from the disk storage so when uh, we are serving something we could uh, increment the counter with the size of the file that it's being served somewhere in the prometheus so that we can get cumulative metrics of the, or perhaps we can, we can get this information from load balancers or somewhere. Don't we have the, the content linked in the logs, in the access logs? Perhaps this, or we can just uh, take a look at bandwidth somewhere. In, uh, oh, yeah. That, yeah. You know, perhaps this is Yeah, but Gregors, but how do you, do you deal with duplicated records? Yeah, same file being downloaded yeah. thousands. Yeah, that, that's... Because, a, I mean... Uh, uh, yeah. Some something is the thing is we can do the we are we do the the disk scanning right we have the that part of pages that uh, scan the the, the 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 disk work the the disk and create the, the the groups and the deployments maybe we can add something in parallel to this that will fetch the size of the thing and yeah, we, we can publish this <laughs> so I, I would still look at bandwidth because. Uh, cumulative bandwidth from all the pages nodes is always going to be higher than the cache we would need to keep on a node. So if, you know, just to get the Why? understanding. Why? Because bandwidth has duplicated requests and this is not the, the kind of cache that you, I mean, yeah, so, the so same I mean page the would not count in the pay cache. Yeah, but the bandwidth is always going to be higher, much higher. Oh, much higher, okay, sure. Higher. So, uh, Checking the cumulative bandwidth would allow us to understand the order of magnitude of the content we would need to cache. So the, the cache will always need to be lower than the cumulative bandwidth, right? So if we can understand if it's one terabyte, if it's 10 terabytes, or perhaps that's just a gigabyte per like an hour or something like that, we don't know. So perhaps this would be an interesting exercise. I, I guess we already have can we, somewhere in the Can we yeah. just uh, look uh, at the size of NFS share? No. So that's Great. everything. That's, that's everything a... we have, not, not the active part we are serving. Okay. So, well, of course, the, NFS, the size of NFS is also a good indicator, but I, I yeah, guess... Yeah, it's that... the right indicator. It tells you how much storage we are using. So, you, you so... will never... You would never cache more than the storage we are using. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's also, so the, the two sizes, the size of NFS, the size of, that we calculate from the bandwidth and the cache will, is always going to be smaller because if, if it turns out that we will need to cache gigabytes uh, or terabytes of, of data on Kubernetes nodes, uh, I, I would say that we would need to rethink our strategy for caching. Because having you know all the nodes in Kubernetes for pages, and each one would need to have like a few terabytes of volumes, that would definitely be a red flag for me that something needs to be improved in terms of how we cache files. Yeah, we may end up needing node affinity and special nodes for pages, which is maybe something that we can afford, but maybe it's not a problem for our average customer. We also have to think about this that maybe yeah. our scale, if something is well documented, our scale can differ from the average customer. So it's something worth considering, but yeah. 
if you need some some data point I can give you is that right now in we are running the project export queue sidekick queue in Kubernetes, and this queue requires storage. So we have a fifty gigabyte limit of ephemeral uh, space available for those sidekick jobs. So is this space is something we have to deal with in any case. So. The more we know about it, the better it is, so we can clearly state the requirements for the installation. Yeah, so that's that's one question, and I, I think there were more there, there there were more questions. I can't remember them right now. Oh, the, the other one was about the the POC. What what we can do as a first step? Yeah, the POC, the latency, the latency. That's what is really interesting. How long does it take in nanoseconds or milliseconds on average to fetch file from the object storage, uh, uncompress it, and serve it? So, can, can we do this by just testing it with a gradual rollout, the same way we did for the um, API lookup? I mean, we already have the the multiple the the multiple sources, so. We can build the object storage source, whatever, and start a greater rollout, and then we can compare metrics and see, yeah, it's slower or it's more or less the same speed. And we give us more realistic numbers than just us guessing. So yeah, I think that would be actually a good second step after the POC. And what's interesting, we already do that in Workhorse. So we uh, have a code in Workhorse that accesses the uh, object storage artifacts or the stuff and, and extracts stuff. Uh, so that's that's interesting. Uh, yeah. What about another another nice question from me? But what about can we do it the way we do the uh, online artifacts serving now? Proxying to pages, like proxy everything to the to the to the AP, to the Rails app to serve the file, or that will be too much. Because this, you know, I can tell you some 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 types of artifacts now you can view online, like HTML or some few different extensions, and not through the artifacts browser, but we can serve them directly. And in order to not serve them under the same domain as GitLab we added this as a proxy to pages even though it doesn't belong there so it's basically the same right we have the artifact and someone wants to read that file and it's just expansion of this could be way slower but at least we don't have to deal with like caching interesting there's definitely a lot of things around that <coughs> that we can do but uh, it, it's too much to keep everything in my brain at once so Okay. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll try to write. I'll try to write this down. Yeah, small steps forward. That that would be probably better. And, uh, so maybe maybe step zero then is to write down all the ideas from this chat and then, then see where where we'll go later on that. Yeah, I'll do that. It makes sense. Uh, one question. We actually a bit over time, but I want to know first is that we are all back to zero percent, and I post to posted to the agenda a link to the uh, dashboard uh, in Grafana. Cross, uh, is that uh, was the reason for rollback or it was something different? I, I'm no, not no, sure what this meant. It's just, it's just a stupid bug on the API side that, that broke some domains. So I'll just submit, uh, after the meeting, I will submit a merge request and we'll assign it to you for review and pass it forward. Okay, uh, but does anyone have an idea what this could be like? This huge RPS increase and it's like growing while. Oh, are... that's that's that's. I guess that is because at four thirty four thirty UTC we switched to fifty percent, and also the traffic started ramping up because Europe is waking up, and that's I guess that's why it went up. No, I, I don't know. It looks like it's ac accumulating something like it's just gradually like linear. No, and, and, and see how it's dropping just when just now when we roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, understand yeah. that that is it is the reason. But I wonder if we I don't know what is RPC <coughs> like. Uh, how many requests per second? Pages? 
the request per second, I think, right? Okay, so it's what client generated, right? Yeah, that's that's how many request pages are uh, uh, receiving. Right. Yeah, I don't understand why it's which, going. By the way, uh, which... Uh, ah, it's pages over here. Okay, so I might be talking. Uh, yeah, anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, if nobody has an idea, I guess I will look into mm, it. That's, uh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it, it looks like very strange and very like worrying. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I was I was thinking about the API at, the, at, at all times. So yeah, if, if that pages itself, it's, it's a bit strange. Is it possible okay, that yeah. we have a bug inside the code part that is only, ex I mean, in, in the, just in the metrics? That is exercised when we go through um, to GitLab API, so that we are keep accumulating something and we never decrease it because it it really looks like this. Yeah, it it shouldn't so if, look like if, this, right? Oh, you mean that we basically collect metric in the in, in the yeah, wrong way? Yeah, yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that somewhere we increment the some metrics. Oh, okay. And it's supposed to decrement at the end with some kind of defer or I don't know, and we don't. And so if all of the requ more requests goes through the, the GitLab source instead of the disk source, more of them get exposed to this bug. But yeah, but then it's guess, because if we, if we didn't say and oh, but yeah, no, because it's, it's per second, right? So it will drop by the time because because time changes. <laughs> you just accumulate over yeah. A period of if time. You, but I, I mean, it's just. Yeah, if you, if you look at the two charts below it, the load balancer component request per second is pretty like flat. And the other one, server component per second is like going up. So it's obviously no, the request per seconds are not like climbing. It's just how we report them. Yeah, that's an interesting good point. Okay, I guess I will ask Kamar to look into this. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I uh, should see what what metric is this. But anyway, that's past the the the, the meeting. And Lab, just to remind you to post the link of the recording for Jaime to take a look. Yeah, yeah so sure. sorry, sorry, guys. Before we go, I just got a really quick question. Um, okay. Yeah, I got these two EMRs. They're in they're in the agenda. Um, is there just documentation for developing under pages? And I just, I'd like to get them merged, but I just wanted to, I guess there's some question about um, should we be developing inside of the GDK or is anyone developing inside the GDK uh, folder structure itself? Uh, or because the, the way I've written the first one is that, you know, we're doing it externally and the second one's about OAuth. So I'm basically uh, developing Git uh, pages outside of GDK and okay. I rarely run GDK to do anything. I rely like 100% on tests and uh, perhaps 99%. But I think it's if people already do have pages cloned uh, under their GDK folder, they can use it. It does not change much. So I would say that it does not really matter where people are, you know, down, have the pages downloaded and what folder they are using. Yeah, but it's easier for onboarding new developers if you have a clear, because it's complex to run everything. So if you have a clear explanation, I mean, this is the way you should do it, then you can do whatever you want, but this is how we suggest you to run everything. So Ex I externally. No, I mean, in turn, I mean, I, uh, I wrote the pages support in GDK, so I'm a bit biased here, but I think we, I mean, the, the company experience should be, you download GDK, everything is there and you yep. can do everything. So you can okay. test all the integration, but I mean, I usually do also externally. So it, it really depends on what you're doing, but I think that in GDK should work because it's the main entry point for onboarding new developers. So, so I, in that we don't really need a guide, right? If it, because we just start. Yeah, basically you can just go and develop inside the GDK now. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a look at the, the first merge request and see whether it's still worth keeping. Um, and then the second one, which is about how to use 
you know, GitLab as an OAuth provider. Um, I think that we that's still useful. Um, and, and so I'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to kind of check with everyone what, what the kind of, you know, official position was. So the official position is we prefer to go inside of GDK. Yeah. Yeah. We can mention that it's all, always possible to have it externally. Yeah, sure. Well, well, well in that case, should we keep, because this guide describes how to do it externally, right? Should we keep this as if you want to develop externally or would that be, you know, a bit confusing? It shouldn't, it doesn't matter, right? Where now, especially now with the Go modules and yep. it can be. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's all the same. And that's what's changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so I I guess a... We just started this in Mar when uh, there were <laughs> no Go modules. Months ago. And pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. uh, okay. But I'm, I mean, I'm happy to close EMR if it's if it's not worthwhile and not merge it. But if it is, if if there's something. So uh, can can you just assign the two mer merge merge request to me and I will take a look. Sure. Okay. Sure. No problem. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Have a good day. Thank Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah. Stay safe, Alicia. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.